years. So I hope you'll learn this and understand that, yeah, we ain't got it all together. We need to trust in the one who does have it all together, okay? Let's give Dennis Swift a warm welcome. Thank, Thank you, you. Again, Dr. Swift. Thank you again. Yes. Well, being on this uh, stage uh, platform reminds me of the old MASH TV series. Yeah, my dad was a general in the Army, a general nuisance, and I'm a little nuisance. I'm back to bother you this afternoon. My dad was very patriotic. He laid down the stripes, and I saw the stars. But it looks like I'm seeing stars again. This cap reminds me of my childhood. Bad luck and no love. I didn't have a stitch of clothes until I was three years of age, and then my mom knit me a little cap so I could stand at the window and look out. And every Christmas, all I ever got was batteries. No toys, just batteries. Bad luck and no love. My dad did one nice thing for me. He took me for a boat ride three miles out into the lake. Threw me out. The swim to shore wasn't bad. The tough part was getting out of the bag. <laughs> bad luck and no love. Even my brother didn't like me. He traded me to his friend for a hamster with asthma and 50 cents. Yeah, and then his friend wanted back the hamster. <laughs> Bad luck and no love. I thought I'd found true love one time. I was on an airplane, and the stewardess looked at me, and she said, you remind me of a movie star. I said, really, which one? She said, Lassie. <laughs> <laughs> Bad luck and no love. When I was a kid, I was kidnapped, and the kidnapper sent a ransom note to my parents. It said, give us $10,000, or you'll see your kid again. Ah, uh, the only bathtub toys I had to play with, that parents would allow me to play with, was a toaster and a hair dryer. <laughs> but then I was eating sugar pop cereal. And this is the true part, <laughs> as a child. And, and uh, they advertised for dinosaurs, that uh, they had little plastic dinosaurs. If you cut off the box top and sent in 25 cents, you'd get a plastic di dinosaur. And I remember being in my grandmother's house, I'd always run out to the mailbox to see if I got my little dinosaur. Little that I know that years later, after attending nine different universities and colleges and studying for three PhDs, I have more degrees than the thermometer, I was educated to be obsolete, that I began to believe that dinosaurs and man didn't live together. But did dinosaurs and man live together? That's our topic this afternoon, and uh, we want to look at that evidence. You know, I don't need to tell this group that scientists say that 65 million years ago the dinosaurs were extinct. If there would be any evidence to the contrary, then evolution would be DOA, dead on arrival. That evolution would melt down faster than the Wicked Witch of the North. I'm looking here at Acambaro, Mexico. This is uh, Valderbal Julesrud. He was a German hardware merchant, and in 1923, he was the co-discoverer of the Chipicaro culture, the oldest in Mexico. But on a sunny day in 1944 in July, he was riding his horse on the side of the mountain of El Toro. He looked down, he saw a piece of pottery sticking out of the ground, and got off the horse, dismounted, dug it out of the ground, and from there, they begin to find many, many, many pieces of ceramics. Um, when I went to the Snitzer Auditorium to hear Dr. Stephen Gould in San Diego, California, you know, auditorium is a compound Latin word. Adios to hear and Taurus the bull. That's what you do when you go hear an evolutionist. <laughs> a sanctuary is a compound Latin word. It means the place of the spirit and truth. We come to hear the spirit and truth when we come into here. Uh, cosmetics is a compound Greek word. It means to bring order out of chaos. <laughs> Hello, ladies. Um, but Valdemar Jusred, this collection began to amass to an astonishing size. This is a hardware store there in Acambaro. This is his old mansion. It was a city block long. It had 12 rooms. And he collected over a period of 20 plus years as they were digging various people excavating 37,500 artifacts. This museum is one that scares scientists, his collection, because in the collection, as they began to assemble it, was not only faces of people and statues of Polynesians and Inuit people and Egyptians and Negroid faces. That was enough to scare the scientists. 
But the most disturbing element of the collection was dinosaurs and man together. Uh, I started in 1968. I first heard when I was in high school about the uh, great Acambaro figurines. Acambaro is 180 miles north of Mexico City. I went down there a few years ago. The collection was in ramshackle cardboard boxes in a storage area. We got permission to get them out. And uh, they had a federal police guy there with an AK-47 guarding the collection as I was taking them out and Don Patton was photographing them. Uh, how did I get a hold of the gun? I told him there was uh, job openings at Walmart in Dallas. No, 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 no. I, we trade. He let me uh, look at it. And uh, in that collection of dinosaurs and other animals that are supposed to be extinct are not even on the North American continent. For what you're looking at right here is a rare species of horse from the Pleistocene period, Pleistocene period of Owens Carvanus. Uh, these horses were not even supposed to be indigenous to the North American continent. It was supposed to be the Spanish who brought horses here, and they were domesticated. Is that not right? Yes. So they not only found, see the kind of frill on the back of the horse like that? That's the way these horses looked. But they also found in the places the teeth of that species of horse. Took it to Gaylord Simpson, an American Museum of Natural History. It was identified, these teeth were identified as that species of horse. And about four years ago, outside of Leon, Mexico, they have found many fossilized remains of this species of horse. They did exist there. Another proof of the uh, Acambaro collection. This is Voldemort George later in life. There is a dinosaur bone there. That's what you're looking at. Some of this material is just out of the collection. In fact, when we were looking at it, uh, there was a newspaper reporter there, and I muttered under my breath, well, we've looked at 863 objects. How many boxes do you think are left in storage? And the guy said 64 or more. About that, 64. I said, I figured, well, that could, that's only about half of what the collection used to be. And it became a national scandal. The guy put it in the newspaper. Vicente Fox was the governor of Guanajuato at that time. Now he is the president of Mexico. He became interested. We went to the National Institute of Anthropology and History. We put pressure on them to try to give us an excavation permit. Uh, we went with Don Patton he, and this gentleman, Carlos Perea. We found him. He was the head excavator at a place called Old Chibicaro in the 1940s. As they were excavating there, he had never seen the jewelry collection. Didn't know about those figurines. We showed him pictures, and he said, yes, here's a dinosaur like this that we excavated at Chipicaro, that kind of figurine. And we also found, he said, in an Indian tomb, a mummified remains of, he described it, we have it on video, of a creature about 18 feet long, ha uh, arms and hands like this, paws, claws, and what's the description of some kind of dinosaur. But in this collection, we see uh, dinosaurs standing up on their back, just like uh, Robert Bacher in his uh, Dinosaur Heres uh, Heresies in 1986 depicted them accurately. We see other dinosaurs uh, from the 1955s. One, one of them in the collection, if you look at the early times of the Iguanodon, the first dinosaurs fossils discovered in the 1840s, when they looked at the discombobulated pile of bones, they didn't know how to assemble it. And as they assembled them together, they put it together wrong for what the dinosaurs looked like. In the Jewelsford collection from the 1940s and 1950s, we can look back on those figurines. And because of the pressure we put on the government, they did do a catalog of them over two years, digital camera. There's 20,000 of them left in the collection. And among those, about 2,000 of them are dinosaurs. But from the 1940s and 1950s, there's iguanodons in that collection, and they look exactly like they're supposed to do by modern paleontologists. And about 60 rare species of dinosaurs. One of the rare species of dinosaurs we could only find in a Japanese, Japanese paleontological book. We see these figurines. Here's another one, an astonishing collection. Earl Stanley Garner, who was the most famous in uh, the Perry Mason series, came out of his detective novel, novels. He became in, in, in detective mysteries. He became involved in this. Charles Hapgood became involved. He went down there. There's radiocarbon-14 dates going back 1,000 years, thermal going back to 2,500 B.C. 
In fact, the Mexican government became involved in 1954. They finally dispatched a team of the most prominent archaeologists and paleontologists from Mexico City. They went there and said, we're not going to dig by El Toro. We're not going to dig in these other locations. They were going to choose our own location. And on the fourth day, they made a startling discovery. As they were digging down, they found some dinosaur figurines. I have a copy of the official report. And we translated it from the Spanish. And in it, it says, in spite of the legality of the find, these cannot be real because they depict dinosaurs. On the basis of the life form, they kicked out the evidence. So we see these. Remarkable. It's proof that man and dinosaurs live together. You know, there's an infinite variety of ways that you could disprove evolution. Of course, if you were to find anything in the fossil record out of order, dinosaur and human footprints together, or any objects out of order, it would show the dinosaurs and man lived together. We go down to northern Peru. This is the Mochi civilization who inhabited the northern coast and deserts of northern Peru from around 30 AD to 900 AD. I would estimate that I've looked at maybe 400,000 plus vases of different Indian cultures down there, pre-Columbian. Uh, not only Mochi, but Nazca and so forth. I haven't handled every one of them, but I've looked at them, and many of them I've ha had in my hand. Uh, in the Mochis, we see... Can you see that dinosaur? The mochis are famous for their stirrup pot vases, the cylindrical vases and portrait figurines that they made. It's always red on white or white on red. We see out of those, I have now found 11 of these that depict dinosaurs. And all of these are the same type, similar species. They have dermal spines. We know as Steven Zirkus in 1992, who was the first one to publish in geology, 1992, that dinosaurs had dermal spines from the fossilized remains of the quarry in Wyoming. And we see that they're similar to an iguana, that the, the frills on the back in different positions, these are correctly depraved, uh, dis displayed and depicted, anatomically remarkable. Um, you heard about the runaway bride over in Georgia? Back there, maybe, it was, uh, not, it was a fiance. <laughs> Our kids don't go down by the, by the sea because there's a dinosaur down there. They had to have seen them in real life to depict them so accurately. Here's another one of the dinosaur vases. One of my favorites, if you look at uh, uh, the, 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 the head and the teeth uh, uh, protruding out and so forth, uh, just as astonishing. This is, is enough right here to put any atheist or agnostic or skeptic out of business. These vases are in museums in Peru and other South American countries. They are authentic. They were found in official exp uh, ex excavations, most of them in the 1920s, uh, and are, some of them were in the collection of the vice president of, Mex uh, of Peru in the 1920s. Uh, we see other of the vases here. Also, this relates to the Ica stones that I showed you last night, because throughout the Indian culture, pre-Columbian civilizations, what we see depicted is the warriors fighting these beasts in combat. But they always show the men, warriors, of equal size or greater size than the beasts they're fighting. Not only is this in the mochi vases, but also in Nazca, in the fabrics I've shown you, the vases from Nazca, the stones, and also the uh, Ica stones another one of the dinosaurs. Isn't this remarkable? Another one. I just want to go through these for the matter of time that we have here. Another part of their culture was uh, they, in the Mochi and the Noskins, in the Mochi was the decapitator. They would cut off the heads of people and they would bury them with the warriors. And in Nazca, about 20% of the graves, you have these trophy heads that they would put on their belts, okay? And here we have a dinosaur creature with a trophy head. Uh, what do you have on these stirrup pot vases, cylindrical uh, vases? You have to do a uh, line. They did line drawing painting, and so you have to take... This is an example of them fighting one of these beasts. We go up the coast to Panamaneca, and the uh, Mochi excavation there... They found a fresco a few years ago. This is a fresco on the wall of a mochi mound. 
We see, can you see the same creature down below? And again, the warriors much larger. And this is proof positive that dinosaurs lived contemporaneously with man. You know, the Jules Ridd collection in Akambaro is uh, a passport, passport for paleontologists to paranoia. When the paleontologists look at that, they have to step back and either dismiss all the evidence or they have to bow to it and say, yes, dinosaurs and man live together. And if that's the case, then the evolutionary flimsy tower of time comes toppling down to the ground in a crumbled heap, and it ushers in an intellectual cataclysm. And we would have to rewrite all of the textbooks. This is the Mochi Ve uh, mask. It is in a museum. It's not Noskin. It's not Inca. It's Mochi. It's a funeral mask. It's solid gold. It's about that big. And you see the two creatures on the side that are very much like the fabrics and the vases, dinosaurs. Now we go down to Mexico, El Tejin, in the jungles of Veracruz. You have to join the battle. You know, God did not save us to be spectate, spectators, but gladiators. We've got to be spirited Spartacuses. You can't set soak sour stink and sink and sit in the pew and stew with the other few. You got to get out there and do something. In the spirit, I'm King Kong strong. I may look like mild mannered Dennis the minister, but when you go on well, Sunday comes, man, I go into the local phone booth. It's not just same old same old. I put on my super pastor cape and I come out to do some battle, my friends. Doctor Bliss's wife a few years ago, she said. They were at a conference, and this very large lady was going into the ladies' restroom. So shall we say well carpeted? And she went in, and they followed her in a minute or two. And she was in there, and she was singing, I'm just going to sit here until Jesus comes. <laughs> you can't just sit and do nothing, folks. you got to get out there. In the, there's a, Christianity, this is not a picnic. It's a battlefield. There's a war going on. And the commander-in-chief wants you to get out there. In El Tahin, this is uh, seldom visited. It's in the jungles. It's a Mayan ruin, about 100 to 1,000 A.D. In fact, they have to keep cutting back the jungle because it's overgrowing these ruins. And uh, We went down there. It's a rogues gallery in the sides of spiders and, and poisonous snakes and all kinds of things. But here what we see on the columns. This was first published in 1968 in Science Digest by Jose Bolio. Uh, Mexican archaeologists, when they were excavating El Tahin, he noticed on one of the columns a pterosaur. And Science Digest published it, a one-page article, and said that this is impossible to a degree, but how could it be that the serpent bird of the Mayans was supposed to be stone dead, this species of, of pterosaur, for 129 million years ago? How could it be that Mayans and pterosaurs met, but they must have because they drew it and carved it on a pillar at El Tahin. Now, I went down there, uh, and we were going through, and the guide said, I've been here 20 years. Uh, there, this doesn't exist. I can tell you. And he asked the other people. He said, no, there's no such thing. But to humor us Americans, he took us around all the ruins, and we kept looking. He said, no, senor, it does not, this does not exist. I said, it has to exist. I know it exists. I said, have you checked everything? Yes, we've gone to every ruin, we've gone to every place. And I said, well, do you have a storage area? Well, yes, we have a storage area. So they got the key, went over to it with another gentleman, they opened up the storage area, and there was the column. And at the bottom was a pterosaur, or pteranodon. It has a serpentine neck, the head crest, all of that. Of course, no permission to photograph. Here's a sketch, one of the books. Now, this is in Utah. I grew up in New Mexico, as I said, it looks like 200,000 square miles of kitty litter. But in 1979, I was at Chaco Canyon, and I studied the Anastasi. The Anastasi inhabited the Colorado Plateau region from about 200 BC to 1300 AD. They exited the area and they disappeared. It used to be a mystery, now we know that there was a drought. 
and they just left. They left everything. You know the last vestiges of their civilization is Mesa Verde. How many of you have ever seen Mesa Verde? Okay. Uh, but Chaco Canyon is a large complex, and I believed in theistic evolution. But I was going along, and I found a book that had just been published by Fran Barnes called Canyon Country Prehistoric Indians. And in the back was a reference to the anomalous rock art about uh, a Diplodocus dinosaur down in the area of natural bridges. So a few years later, when I heard a creationist, I didn't believe the creationists had, I thought they were just like the Kellogg's Convention, you know, fruits and nuts. They had no evidence. And then finally I heard a creationist, he said, dinosaurs and man live together. Do you know that there's a miracle in your house? Your future is not out there or back there, it's up there in the heavens. You gotta reach down and pull it, pull it, reach up and pull it down. But not only that, God has probably already placed something in your hands right now that's gonna change your life. And that book changed my life because years later when I heard somebody, it popped in the back of my mind. I used to read three or four books a week and I did that for about 20 years. I have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of books. But that one book changed my life. And I went in there, and I called some people, and I said, let's go looking for that. I went to Fran Barnes in Moab, Utah. He said, I've never seen it. We couldn't find anybody who had seen it. And I searched off and on for it for six years. Uh, in fact, if you used to go there in, the, in this canyon region, which is now part of the Natural Bridges Monument, you has to, used to have to go by horseback 12 miles. And then you'd have to climb down this winding path into the bottom. And in fact, when the Anastasi left in 13 AD, they left everything intact. They left their, their ruins, they left the pillar posts. Usually they would always take the trees with them. The pottery was left there. In about 1300 A.D., they evacuated, and for 700 years, no one, almost no one, was ever in that canyon. Maybe a few Ute Indians. The first major exploration of this canyon was 1961, the Audrey Hober ex 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 Expedition. And under Kachina Bridge is this petroglyph. It's Anastasi. How do we know it's Anastasi? Number one, the... Cayente Anastasi were the people who were down in that region into the canyon. It is done by the stipple method. The stipple method, the, the Indians, this is a 12 foot ledge. I've gone down in there with a ladder. The Indians used to make wooden ladders. It's 12 feet up. Uh, the dinosaur is 36 inches long. The tail is about 17 or 18 inches long. I've done a rock art rubbing there before. The desert varnish all around it Heavy patination. Takes hundreds of years. Can you notice that? There's, there's desert varnish that builds up over a period of time. We know that it's Anastasi based on the other petroglyphs all around it. A petroglyph is a Greek word. Compound means rock carving. And they used it. Ch -ch -ch. They would take a chisel with a beveled end after they drew it out like this. And then they had hammers, stone hammers, and they go... with phenomenal accuracy and about 50 to 75 hits per square inch. That's how they made it. I know that, I've studied it. Showing here how they went there and did the stipple method hitting it. Here's an artist's rendering of it. This is from 1961, the expedition. Polly Shasma, who is a world-renowned authority on rock art. Notice what they say, a dinosaur-like zoomorphic petroglyph. Here's the rock art rubbing that I've done. You can't do that anymore, so don't try it. But I was the one who brought this back into the light of, of creationism, published on it back in the 1980s and early 90s. How many of you remember that movie, Planet of the Apes? That epic, best blockbuster movie where the astronauts go out into space and after several years they come back and eons have passed by on Earth and Taylor, the astronaut who's played by Charlton Heston, he comes and he finds it's a strange, weird world because orangutans and, and chimpanzees and gorillas are walking around upright and speaking, and humans are in zoos. I used to go to the San Diego Zoo, the world's largest zoo, because animals come from all over the world to watch people. 
and these apes are watching the people and they capture him and the other astronauts. They got him in there. And then there's Dr. Zayas, the evil gorilla. And he has this, he suppresses scientific truth and they have a tribunal and here come Charlton Heston in, in chains and, and they take him there and he says, this is scientific heresy. Apes have always been here. Humans are ignorant and they can't speak. And Charlton Heston speaks and Dr. Zayas goes loony and he says, Zara must have performed an experiment on you and you're a mental monster. And somehow, you know, Charlton Heston escapes and he jumps on a horse and he's riding away. And the gun-toting gorillas are on horseback with Dr. Zayas in hot pursuit and they're going to the forbidden zone. No guru. Ape has been in the forbidden zone for 1,200 years. Because when they were digging archaeologically, they had to abandon it because of what they found. And then Charlton Heston and all the people are up in the, in the cave. You remember that? And here comes Dr. Zayas. And Charlton Heston starts giving, there's the ancient diggings of the archaeologists, of the apes. And they found these artifacts. And Charlton Heston holds them up and says, see, this proves. And then finally he picks up from the lowest level a human doll that's dusty. And Dr. Zayas debunks it and he says, my granddaughter plays with human dolls. And then somehow they pull the string and the doll cries, mama, mama. Oh no, humans speak. All the theories are wrong. That petroglyph of a dinosaur is the equivalent of finding a doll. Did you hear me? It is a pedestal smashing blow to evolution. I might do my own movie. I'd call it the planet of the evolutionists. <laughs> that here is a remote Indian tribe in Colorado cut off from civilization for thousands of years. And National Geographic finds them. And of course you've got to educate the savages. savages. So they send the Native Americans away to schools. And the young braves come back talking about evolution. And dinosaurs were millions of years ago. And the wise old chief, played by me, <laughs> says, wait a minute. Our ancestors, the ancient ones, they danced not only with wolves, but probably danced with dinosaurs. And then you have this scene where the chief takes the Indians and the evolutionists and the scientists and the news media down into the canyon. And Mel Gibson is playing me at that part. And they say, where's the evidence? And in that dramatic moment, he points up. There, there, there it is. The dinosaur on the canyon wall. And the braves go, yes, yes, yes. And they start dancing to Dancing with Dinosaurs tune. And they're all just jubilation because it destroys evolution. But of course, just like in the movie The Planet of the Apes, they blew up the cave. The evolutionists want to blow up the evidence. But when they get down there in the bottom of the canyon, they find Dr. Carl Ball, Ken Hoven, Dr. Quazo, linked hand to hand around the sacred shrine, protecting it. <laughs> My friend, God a long time ago left some evidence behind. Of course, if they did film the movie at the end, then people would be chanting in the streets, save the planet from the evolutionists. Well, here's the references to, uh, in Barnes' book about the petroglyph. Another one in regards to the other uh, anachronistic uh, oddities and anomalies of rock art. So that's what we're investigating. In 1998, I was way out in a remote region of Utah, Cowboy Caves. It's about 130 miles from the nearest town. And I'd heard a rumor that there was a Triceratops petroglyph. We didn't find it. I was with Don Patton. We went back into Moab, and I stopped at a rock shop. And that day, I was wearing a Bolivian jacket. It was so loud, it would talk to you. <laughs> and so this old, leathery-skinned old-timer said, Son, where'd you get that jacket? I said, Down in Bolivia, visiting, uh, down in Bolivia, visiting Olivia's sister, Bolivia, OK. And I said, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I travel around looking for dinosaurs and man evidence. I said, you ever seen anything like that? And he turned and started proceeding out of the rock shop. And I followed him. 
And he went to his old pickup and he opened up the door. And I said, well, sir, have you ever seen anything uh, of dinosaur petroglyphs? He said, I've lived around here 60 years. He said, once, 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 41 years ago, I had a rancher call me and tell me that he had on his property a petroglyph of a triceratops. And he said, I went to see it. I said, well, it was a triceratops. He said, it looked like it to me. He said, I told a paleontologist in the state of Utah, and he said, leave it alone. It could ruin my reputation. I'm not going to come and look at it. And this old guy started swearing and saying, well, you know, what about, you know, who cares about your reputation? Aren't you caring about the truth? I said, tell us where it's at. He said, well, you go, you know, 46 miles like this, and you go down this winding path, and there's a hay bale down there, and, and there's this cliff that everything looks the same. He hadn't been there for 41 years. And then as he's getting ready to leave, he said, the only people I don't want to know about this are the creationists. You're not one of those creationists, are you? No, I'm not saying. So I said, Don, let's go. And we went chasing off. And we went down in this winding path and uh, near south, just across the border, the Utah LaSalle Canyon. And this canyon was not, uh, no white people, no settlers had even gone in there until the late 1870s. Very remote. Do you see the triceratops, the three horns, the parrot beak, everything? We know this is uh, Abajo LaSalle Anastasi Indians. For a fact. And so we're looking at about 1000 AD. I did a rock art rubbing of it. You see the stipple method again, chipping, pum, 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 pum. You can see the indentations, the weatherization, the pitting. That's impossible to fake. And the little man. The first publication scientifically, any knowledge of the Triceratops was 1881. I found some, a man, he's now deceased. His brother, in 1914, inscribed his name on the other side of the panel, right in the, in the rock. And if you look at it, it's bright white. The other things is desert varnish. This man, his family had homesteaded home the place many, many years ago, and he had first seen it in 1917. So it was there, all the way back in there. So it's not something new. It wasn't faked. This is the, you see the kebab type earrings? The Abajo Lasau Indians had big earrings. There again, the triceratops. This is probably Buckaroo Banzai, the cowboy. We have riding the triceratops. Uh, now I take you to another place, the Hornada Mugiwan Indians, who were contemporaneous with the Anastasi uh, about 200 BC to 1400 AD. Uh, my first time I ever flew to California, I was on a plane. And a little lady said, son, where are you going? I'm going, I said, I'm going to El Cajon and, and San Jose. She said, out here, we pronounce that uh, J like an H. It's El Cajon and San Jose. How long are you going to be staying? Oh, only until Hoon or January. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's not, it's not, you're not at Honana Mogulad, Indian, Mogulad Indians. Um, you know, you need to pray. Do you believe in prayer? I hope you do believe in prayer. The Holy Spirit knows where, do you know God knows where everything is? He knows everything about our lives. He knows every hair that's on your head. He's got them numbered. In some cases, he knows how many hairs are not on your head. He knows your true weight that should be on your driver's license. He knows how many strands are in your wig. He knows your true hair color. He's known every person who ever lived here. He knows everything about it. He knows where every object is. He knows where everything has ever been buried, and he knows about it. And if you'll pray to him, Jesus said you have not because you ask not. He said my sheep hear my voice. Some way there ought to be a dynamic mental image, some kind of prompting by the Spirit of God for you to get off, off your differential, and God would lead you to things if you begin to pray. I believe that. I believe it. Just after 9-11, I felt this prompting to go look for another petroglyph. Nobody else was flying. I got on United anyway. United, United Flight 50-50, go on to runway 13 and take your chance. Anyway, I got on the... <laughs> Because I'm going to get another star in my cap. <laughs> anyway, okay. Wait. <laughs> so I get down there to uh, this area. And um, you got to do that because the devil is the god of this age. 
And there could be a moment you'll meet somebody, and if you're there at the right time, at the right place, at that prompting, you'll get the evidence. If not, you'll miss it. And I went down there with this great petroglyph site, our Nanamuggy one. In one area, one mile and a quarter by three quarters of a mile, there's over 25,000 petroglyphs. And I stopped and I asked guy, he said, is such and such. He said, a rancher said years ago they saw a petroglyph of what he called Godzilla, a Godzilla creature. Now, know what do I need to do here? I've messed this up. Who's it? Do I put it? Who's the technician real quick while I keep talking? Anybody can have a creation ministry. <laughs> Last year, I couldn't even spell preacher. Now I are one. Where's that guy who learned how to speak PowerPoint last year? Where's Lewis? Say it again. Come up here real quick. Come here. Come here. What? Oh, it's marvelous. Do you see the, um, the dinosaur on the left, the rock, the flamboyant head crest, the teeth, everything? And then the, uh, the deer, it's, the dinosaur is up on its hind legs like this, and across it is a deer. Of course, it's stylized a little bit. You can tell that's a deer, even though deers don't have rectangular-shaped bodies. See it? Now look at a parasophal office. Look at that. That's what that is. The Indians had to see it. Look at the eye structure right here. Just like a modern paleontologist would, would draw it. Phenomenal. Uh-oh. Oh, I missed one. The next one was supposed to be this big dinosaur of a fire-breathing dragon. Somehow it got lost here. That's why it said, did you see that? Here it is. Oh, when did you see that? See what? Me operating the computer? No, it's this. <laughs> Job 41, verses 18 through 21. The Leviathan, remember? Out of his mouth come burning lamps. Uh, sparks leap out. Out of his nostrils smoke as a boiling cauldron or a seething pot. His breath kindles coals and flames shoot out from his mouth. What is that but a description of a fire-breathing dinosaur. By the way, when the patriarch Job pitifully buffeted Job, setting in an ash heap, covered with boils, crying out of his abysmal misery, lost his family, lost his fortune, lost everything, and he's asking God why. What did God, how did God answer him? He gave him seven chapters of science questions. Have you been to Pleiades? Have you been to the bottom of an ocean? Have you done this? Have you, have you seen the chief of all my creation, the behemoth? Have you seen the fire-breathing dragon? What kind of a God is this? We know him, but we don't know him. When you suffer, he gives you science questions. <laughs> Here's a fire-breathing, the Wapatka Indians, the American Southwest, with the Sonola Indians. This is a very remote, inaccessible location. It's on government land, and you have to get special permission, a permit, and everything else. You have to be accompanied by a park ranger. And you have to hike eight or nine miles to this location. Can you see the fire-breathing dinosaur done by the Wapatki Indians? The pitting, the weatherization. From another angle. And there's petroglyphs around it. The Havasupa Indians, you're familiar with this one. I won't cover that link to that. We go to the barrier style. This is the Pteratodon, Pterosaur. It's down in the San Rafael swell region of Utah. I first investigated this in the 19, early 1980s. You can see depicted on sandstone. Uh, many people take this area for granted, but actually it's sandstone. And uh, you look at the pterosaur, eight feet, six inch wing spread. And when I first wrote about it in journals, uh, people said, no, no, it's not a pterosaur, it's not a pteratodon, because look, the wings are billowing out like this. Now we know that some of the species of pterosaurs could hover like a, a kite hawk and they had uh, flexible membranes, and they could hover over their prey. Then they said, no, it can't be a pterosaur because of the web-like feet. 
And I said, well, you know, pterosaurs and pteranodons in swamps, they probably had feet like ducks. Now we have found fossilized evidence down in Brazil in the Santana Formation that they did have web feet. Also, you'll notice the flamboyant head crest. Uh, according to Robert Bacher, the only, the pteranodons had this kind of flamboyant headgear. Here's a depiction of it here. Also, it's done in hematite. This was done by the Desert Archaea Indians about 2000 BC. They would take a reed straw from the river, a reed. They mixed an emulsifier of egg whites and other materials, and they had minerals, hematite, and they would take it like this. And this is a pictograph, which means a, a rock painting, and they would spray it. And that's, what, that's the way that's done. And on the top of the wings, or the pteranodon means five clawed, there are claws on the top of the wings. And I've done microscopic studies. There's teeth right here in the beak going out. And then there's a bulbous point at the end. And people said 10 years ago, oh, no, no, there's no species of pteranodons that had that kind of a beak. Now we have found in Italy some, some evidence that indeed some species of pterosaurs had this kind of bulbous bulb at the end of the beak. The Indians had to have seen it to draw it accurately. And you know the Thunderbird, and the, all Indian legends about the Thunderbird, that the Thunderbird when it flew, that the wind and the air would vibrate and the earth would thunder that were so big. The Inuits up in Alaska say that this bird was so large that it could grasp a small baby whale in its talons. You see some other depiction. Herodotus mentions a pterosaur. This is the uh, La Salle Baja Indians down in uh, the Indian Creek area of Utah. Strithomimus, Erythomimus, you can see, look like that. This is the Mayan vase down in Mexico that I found. See it? Like a Allosaurus or an Albertosaurus. 100 AD. Now the jungles of the Yucatan, the Judgment Muriel at Bonham Park. If you look closely at the bottom, you will see these Mayans with headdresses, exotic headdress. Then you have lions and tigers and parrots. And one of them is of a Dinonychus species of dinosaur. Can you see it? Now we look very closely. Here's a paleontological animated replica of a Deinonychus. Here's their head, just like, and you see the thing in the back right here? Just like the headdress that we have at Bonham Park, done about eight or 900 AD, maximum, approximately. So dinosaurs were among the mines. This is a Chimu vase that I own, and there's an also a dinosaur creature engaged in combat with a warrior. Once again, the warrior's larger. This is the controversial Silver Bell artifacts found in 1924, four miles outside of Tucson on the old Silver Bell Road. They were excavating in a, in a lime kiln, and they found in this lime kiln some objects, they, eventually 32 of them. And William Cummings, Brian Cummings, University of Arizona, was involved. He was called out, and people said, no, no, they're, they're a fraud, they're a hoax because they have Hebrew and Latin inscriptions from 7 to 900 A.D. There's also a sword, and you may not be able to see this clearly, but there's a 19-inch dinosaur on this sword. Oh, can you see it better there? Somebody can see it? 19 inches long. And William Cummings, who was the curator of the uh, uh, Arizona State Museum, he was a professional archaeologist. He was a professor at the Arizona State University, he went down there to look at it, and they began to excavate in Cleachy and limestone. They dug a 12-foot trench, and at 12-foot trenches, they were digging along, they came to these objects that were impacted in limestone. They had to use crowbars, chisels, and other tools to get them out of the limestone. And they had 32 objects, including this sword with a dinosaur on it. There was a great scandal in the controversy in the 1920s. The Smithsonian Institute, the New York newspapers were saying, ah, it's obvious, they're a fake. William Cummings put his whole academic career on the line and said, I'm telling you, I can tell you they are real. 
and he lost his job eventually over it. Carl Saul, who had a PhD in archaeology, Indian archaeology, he had written many articles. He was well known in the 20s. He went out and investigated. And he found that the Hohokam Indians had built a layer above these artifacts. And the artifacts were 7 to 900 A.D., and the Indians at about 1,000 A.D. had built some stuff over it. It was below that layer. Then uh, Randolph Judd, William Randolph Judd, he was at the American Museum of Natural History. It used to be called the National Museum. He was a skeptic. He was trying to debunk it. He went down to Arizona to destroy the evidence in the terms of academically as an impossibility. And the one he wrote, he wrote that it was obvious that the specimens were below a layer of limestone and cleachy. They had not been planted there. He said, but he figured that the conquistadors had left them there in about 1540s. They had brought them when they came over across the southwest. Wait a second, you still have a problem. From the time of the hoofbeats of the conquistadors to the discovery of the first dinosaur bones was 300 years. Of course, they are in a vault at Arizona State University Museum, and they rarely ever take them out. Oh, you know, the Do Dova TV special, dinosaur and human footprints were found together. Uh, this would counter evidence. Uh, Ernest Meyer said that creationists have stated that dinosaurs and man were contemporaneous. If that momentous statement were true, then the names of the discoverers would be thundered down the halls of time. These individuals would be known as making one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. I'd like to thank him for the compliment. Evolution is down for the count. I gave up boxing because of my hands. The referee kept stepping on them. I had the champ on one knee the other day. He was on one knee, making sure I was all right. Hey, you know what a woman tells a man with two black eyes? Nothing. She's already told him twice. <laughs> all right, I mean, listen, evolution loses on the basis of the petroglyphs, the ceramics, the eco stones. Now let's look at some dinosaur and human footprints. Let's go to the American Southwest. When I was at the site looking at the Hornonomogiwan Indians, I was praying. I said, Lord, if there's anything else anywhere, please show it to me, help me. And the next day, I took a different route home than I normally would to the airport. And I came to a place where there was only four people who lived in that area. Only four. And I was talking with this guy. And I said, have you ever seen anything strange? Like what do you mean strange? Because <laughs> this guy was like a redneck rancher. And the guy across the street was a survivalist. Liberal. There's only people who live in town. These two families. Four people. And he said, well, I said, I, said, I said about dinosaur tracks or human tracks. And he said, well, I have a friend named Lefty. A few years ago, he was riding horseback up in this canyon. He fell off. The horse bucked. He fell off. And he swears that he saw on this slab these human footprints and dinosaur tracks. Really? Hey, wait, I, did we pray about this? Does God not know? Who knows? Does not God know that Lefty lives somewhere in the American Southwest? <laughs> and that he's Spanish? He's the guy I told about the job at Walmart. No, 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 no. Anyway, what happened, I, eventually, several years we went looking, and Lefty had a vague description. We're going up in these canyons. And you're looking at uh, this slab. It's about 10 feet by 12 feet. And on the slab are about eight or nine footprints, there's some child footprints in a layer of rock that over 100 million years old. There's nine and a half foot size footprints, 10 foot, 10, size 10, size 12. We had to put a little water on them so you can see them. There was a layer of dust covering them. We had a long time to find them. You see this one? This is humongous. This is 18 and a half inches long. Why we know people didn't have feet that big? 18 and a half inches, that's a whopper, isn't it? That's about a size 26. You kill O'Neill only weighs a size 24. The largest size shoe right now in America is a size 44 by a young man who lives down in Texas. 
I went to Oddball Shoes in Portland a few years ago, and they gave me the, the sketch, the, the guy's footprint sketched out. And Dr. Ball has some of this material, and New Balance gave him his first pair of shoes. It cost him over $5,000. Before that, he used to put plywood on the bottom of his feet with rubber hose stuff. Bad luck and no love. And then what happened is he came along and they built, gave him these shoes. 18 and a half inches. And it also has six toes. Did you know it was a common occurrence among Anastasis we found in their tombs and graves in the American Southwest that a percentage of those people had si uh, larger feet, and, but some of them had, lots of them had six toes and six fingers. And in the petroglyphs you'll see six fingers, six toes. Here's a giant, so to speak. Fossilized giant, supposed to be 12 feet tall. Remember David in the Bible, 9-1, Goliath? And he went out there with a slingshot. Here's the slingshot, 2,000 years old. This is the way the slingshot, they didn't do it like this. They went like this, like this. See? And when he hit Goliath, he hit him right between the running lights, remember? And Goliath said, such a thing has never entered into my mind before. Pew! And he came crashing down. The American Medical Journal in uh, 1985 did a study, and they found of giantism that people who become giants, that they have the last part is a soft spot right in their head when the bones form. This is in a medical article. I'm not a medical expert. I'm Mr. Know a few things, but that's what the medical article said. And David with a, a rag and a rock, heads begin to roll. And then when he knocked, the, you know that the ancient Israelites, if you read this stuff, do you know how they practiced? They practiced aiming at the head. It wasn't by accident. Hmm. And then when he had him on the ground, you know what he did? He got on his sword, and he cut off his head so fast that he didn't even know it until he sneezed. <laughs> Whatever problem you face, when you get it down on the ground, you better take care of it. Here's a giant, Maganov. He's nine feet, three inches. That's pretty tall, isn't it? Here's when he was 9'4", the world's smallest people, 3'6". Uh, Here's some giants in Mongolia, about 8 feet tall. Here's Robert Wadlaw. He was 8 feet, 11 and a quarter inches. Dr. Boss probably got his jacket and his shoes at his museum. He does. Uh, here's when he's a Boy Scout. Hello, mother, hello, father. Okay, we're, oh, there, see? Here's a gentleman uh, who's 8 feet, 9 and a quarter, 503 pounds, 1900. This gentleman was 8'6", 550 pounds. This guy was 8 feet three inches. Here's a lady who's seven feet nine inches. Another giant, Russian giant, eight feet. Two giants from the Civil War, two giant people measuring each other, marrying each other. This guy was in the movies for many years, Johan Peterson, and he was uh, eight feet eight inches tall. The tallest man in the world, Leonard. He was eight four, understanding ways he went through a growth spurt. He's eight seven. I gotta go quickly. There's the giant footprint, more of the footprints. See the dinosaur tracks? I don't have time. Dinosaur and human tracks. Could I have two minutes? Can I have two minutes? I only got two, I only two minutes. Oh, it's only, it's only got me two minutes. Two minutes. Oh! Uh, two minutes. I'm going to quit on this. Turkmenistan is just above Afghanistan next to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, uh, Pakistan, and near Stan the Man and Chipistan. It's over in Central Asia. And uh, I was the first person from the Western world to go to the Dinosaur Plateau. There had been one other guy from National Geographic. The, Nas the Dinosaur Plateau, oh, we got to get out there and find the evidence. That's why I went to Turkmenistan. And here's the longest, five of the longest dinosaur trackways in the world are on this plateau on the side of the mountain. And it was so rare. They had never even seen a white person there. These AD Asiatic of, uh, and other... Uh, Mongolian-like looking people, and they followed me around. The translator for me, he had studied English for 30 years. He had taught English for 25 years. He never met an English-speaking person. And they would follow me around. And they're Muslims. You know, cut your head off. <laughs> but not super pastor. <laughs> Chuck Abula. Anyway, this trackway is... Uh, 1,020 feet long, 311 meters. It's a megalosaur trackway. It's the longest in the world. There's another one, 875 feet. See there, it is the, the translator's shoes inside. That's the largest dinosaur footprint we have from the Jurassic. I have made a cast of it. It's 28 inches long, 23 inches wide. The megalosaur is quite a one. We first read about this in Moscow News, 1983, and uh, this was when an atheistic communist empire and they talk about it. And this is when they were under complete control not to say anything other than evolutionary dogma. 
And here's what the guy wrote. He said, perhaps our ancestors, far removed ancestors, did mingle with the dinosaurs because this Russian had gone there and seen dinosaur and human footprints together. Kurban Aminazov, Turkmenistan scientist, educated at Moscow State University, PhD, he wrote in a 1986 in the Russian journal Around the World that he studied this and he said that these human footprints or hominoid footprints are from the Jurassic time. They're not, not 5 or 10 million years ago, but at least 150 million years ago. How could it be that dinosaurs and men were together in the same place? They think this was like a, an ancient lake bed, but I believe it was the flood. And that these creatures came together. There's also the spiral horned goat tracks. There's mammal tracks on the same plateau, human tracks, and dinosaur tracks. Uh, Alexander Bushoff in uh, Pravda in January 31st, 1995, he wrote about these footprints that he had seen. And you know what he says? He says, well, wait a second. It probably wasn't humans. It was aliens who came down in their bathing suit and promenaded along with the dinosaurs. Who says scientists don't believe in miracles? I do believe in UFOs. How many of you believe in UFOs? UFOs, uncommitted freeloading onlookers. Every Sunday we have them. Section A, Section B, okay. Here's um, <laughs> the, the footprints. There's about six human footprints, full footprints, two half footprints, but they're size 43, triple E. Oh, that's Russian, though. American, it's nine and a half. We have the guy putting his footprint there. Here's an example of the footprint, right? One of the footprints. We made cast of it, latex cast. See this? The footprint. Dr. Baugh has these. He's going to make a copy. Is, is Carl Baugh here? He's a, what a fine gentleman. Oh, people have asked me, whatever happened to Osama bin Laden? When I was in Turkmenistan, they have the pictures. He was eaten by a T-Rex. <laughs> Just having fun. Thanks. We're done.